Hello. Based on the content warnings included beforehand, you can probably tell I'm going to be talking about some pretty heavy subject matter, as well as presenting a pretty political reading of Jujutsu Kaisen. Before I actually start my analysis of Maki Zenin, I want to quick address a few things. Firstly, I want to inform you that my analysis is going to be filled to bursting with manga spoilers. Like seriously, two spoilers are coming up in T minus like three sentences? If you've only watched the anime or you've never experienced any part of the story of Jujutsu Kaisen and spoilers are something that personally bothers you, I'd recommend clicking off since supporting my reading of the work and my interpretation of Maki will require me to cite material from the entire series. Secondly, I want to shut down the western politics in my anime type of dudes, because pretending like active xenophobia, misogyny, and discrimination based on physical ability aren't issues that Japanese people face is patently ridiculous. Also, trying to present the manga starring the community-based anarchist who murders conservative politicians and wants to open a metaphorical barrier around Japan also features the second best piece of trans representation I've ever seen in a shonen manga as non-political is such a ludicrously head-up ass take that I'm not going to bother engaging with any comments along this line. Also, if you're interested on what views of Japanese culture and politics I'm using to inform my reading of the manga, I've curated a list of resources in the description below about Japan's misogyny, xenophobia, and ableism problems, and I highly recommend giving them a read, not just for this video, but because it's a great way of expanding your understanding of the cultural landscape which the Japanese media you consume is made in. Lastly, I want to say that this video is written under the assumption that you have at least a passing familiarity with Jujutsu Kaisen and its world building. I think you should be able to follow this video just fine even if you are new to the series, but nonetheless I wanted to give you a heads up before I just talk about domains and cursed energy like you know what the hell I'm talking about. Now. With all that out of the way, let's crack into Maki. Within Jujutsu Kaisen Zero, we're introduced to Maki Zenin as a first year student at Jujutsu Tech and learn quite a few things about her. Firstly, she's presented with a very headstrong personality with low tolerance for even the slightest bit of incompetence as a result of her upbringing. This puts her in direct contention with Yuta Kotsu, the main character of the section of the story, as she continually gets more fed up with his inability to keep up with her and to push his own limits. It's only later within this section of the story that her and Yuta have a heart to heart and we get to understand a bit more about her. She opens up about how she's actually a member of one of the three big Jujutsu families, the Zenin clan, where she had previously been mistreated for both being a woman and having no cursed energy. Within the narrative, a thematic parallel can easily be drawn between this lack of cursed energy and the idea of disability, as the literal and most obvious physical trait used to indicate her lack of cursed energy is her glasses. Nearly 31% of Japanese people wear glasses. And because of that, it's very easy to assume that nearly 31% of Japanese people have some level of visual defect. This is comparable to most developed countries within the world. This interestingly does make visual impairments and glasses both the most common disability, but also the most common form of assistance for somebody with a disability. Maki's glasses aren't due to her weak vision, but instead due to her inability to see cursed spirits. An ability everybody else in the cast shares, but she needs a specialized tool to assist her with, much like most people in the world with the most common type of disability. This goes to recontextualize her previous beratements of Yuta further. It's understandable for somebody who has to work hard for respect both as a woman and as somebody who has to use different tools to assist her to do things that others are able to do from birth. 
and with this it makes perfect sense that she'd be annoyed by a man who essentially is given the highest seat in their society because of some birthright. He is a reflection of her in that he gets all the things she never did when she was younger. It's only when Yuta opens up about his interpersonal struggles and really listens to her own goals and how she wants to become the head of the Zenin family that the two are able to build a meaningful relationship. They take the time to understand each other's struggles, their own interpersonal lives, and only then can Maki see that while, yes, Yuta is incredibly privileged by his ability, he also struggles with quite a few things in his life. Unfortunately, Maki didn't get much else to do in this early Jujutsu Kaisen Zero material, so we're going to have to look a little later into the material to really go deeper. When we see Maki next, she's a second year and is brought in to assist during the Kyoto School Goodwill event. This event is a contest held by both the Kyoto and Tokyo Jujutsu High Schools. It's important to note that through other characters, it's shown that the Kyoto School is far more conservative and old fashioned. And through this lens, we have each of our main Tokyo Tech characters contend with an ideological representation of the issues they face from older and more conservative generations of sorcerers. For example, Megami faces off with Noritoshi Kamo, who we'll discuss a bit more later, as a metaphorical battle against the rigid and eugenicist worldview of the big three families he was born into. So who does Maki face, and how does it reflect a deep-rooted conservative issue? My Zenny, Maki's twin sister, is introduced here. The two are clearly in conflict from the moment they share a glance, and they share a pretty deep history with one another. It isn't explored a lot in their initial meeting, but it is once they begin their fight with each other during the Goodwill event. During the conflict, it's revealed that Mai has both cursed energy and a curse technique. She attempts to use both in combination with her six caliber pistol to attempt to suppress her sister with gunfire, whilst she attempts to suppress her with words. Putting her down for a lack of cursed energy and technique, calling her ugly and attempting to bait her into anger. During this, the two's history is revealed. Maki, the lowest member of the family, decided to put herself forward to attempt to raise her own status and in an attempt to obtain fair treatment by vocalizing her plan to become the head of the Zenin family. Due to this, Mai saw herself slipping and becoming a new bottom in the social rung. Their sister leaves her position as servant, and because of this, she grows to hate her sister. She claims to have been comfortable where she was, and that she's furious with Maki for wanting more. I find this interesting in how it directly reflects the failings of feminism that fails to take intersectionality into account. Often within women-led spaces, it's incredibly easy for women to promote a form of patriarchal oppression in order to secure their own perceived position within the social order. White women will always put down black women, cis women will always put down trans women, and abled body women will always put down disabled women. This comes to them as a built-in response that's taught to them by a misogynistic society. Often, women with higher positions will always put the women below them down in order to secure their own representation. So quick aside, I find this sort of deal with it attitude from TERFs especially annoying. Like, honey, I don't know who you think you are, but they're trying to beat, rape, and kill you too. Putting me down isn't going to help you get ahead. Unfortunately though, misogyny and racism is so deeply ingrained that often it's hard to ever get it out of somebody no matter how pro-woman they present themselves as. And through this lens, we get a pretty interesting look at Mai. She doesn't understand that the oppression her sister faces is multifaceted, and much worse than hers. From Mai's point of view, the only woman who was below her in the family social order is now attempting to surpass her. 
Mai was comfortable with her own oppression, as she had the ability to give the Zenin family a child with a cursed technique and cursed energy. She knows she could at the very least secure her place in this cruel patriarchal structure as a mother due to her fortunate circumstances. But when Maki, somebody who wasn't afforded these opportunities, challenges that patriarchal system from the ground up, it threatens Mai's social position. When Maki catches Mai's bullet and defeats her, Mai breaks down and asks, What's so bad about being a servant? What's wrong with doing chores and living a normal life? Why didn't you? Why didn't you stay with me at the bottom? And to that, Mai can only reply, If I had done that, I would have hated myself. It's as simple as that. Once in my own life, I had a cis woman who was a friend ask, Why don't you just settle for being a man and not transition? Why do you have to fight for something that you know is dangerous? I've had many queer cis and cishet friends voice a sentiment like this to me, essentially asking why I couldn't comply in my own erasure as a woman and in my gender identity. And for a long time, I never really had a strong or good answer. But now I usually tell them, because if I had done that, I would have hated myself. When we as women face oppression, it's often easy for other women to wonder why we would challenge that oppression, if it directly leads to a worse outcome. Especially women who were gifted opportunities we could never imagine. And I think that this battle is a beautiful way of illustrating that conflict within femininity. Mai, the frustrated, gifted woman, demanding that Maki give in to her subjugation for the sake of her own personal comfort. And because of that, she's defeated. Because Maki can change, Mai can't. Okay, so a lot happens during the Shibuya incident arc, but luckily for us, barely any of it has to do with Maki directly, so I only have like two things to catch you up on. So Maki returns to assist with a battle that's being waged in Shibuya during the night of Halloween. She pairs up with Nanami and the current head of the Zenin clan, Naobito. There's a fun bit of character work here, where Nanami and Maki realize just how drunk off his ass Naobito is. And we get a small panel of Maki saying that she thinks she'd be more of use than him. I love this because it's just a small cute detail that shows a bit more of Maki's personality and how she's fed up with all the dumbass men in her life and how she feels a need to compare herself to them. Also, love her little face here. She makes a lot of good really little faces. Anyway, the three fight a special grade curse, yada yada, but what's most important is during this fight they're interrupted by a reanimated Toji Fushiguro, who yoinks the shit out of Maki's curse tool and proceeds to wombo combo kill the cursed spirit. And at this point, Maki, for the first time, sees what a complete heavenly restriction looks like, and finally gets someone with her disability who she can look up to. Quickly after this, Jogo pulls up and fire blasts the shit out of the three of them and kills Naobito. Okay, there, you're caught up on everything Maki related in this section of the story. Nope, seriously, that's all she does, and that's all that's kind of important. Nothing else happens here. Don't worry about it. After the events of the Shibuya incident, the Zenin family is put into chaos as the head of the house has died. And left in his will, Nabito leaves the clan to Megami Fushiguro as the new head. With this information out on the table, the rest of the family is left furious. 
Meanwhile, Maki and Megumi scheme how to take down the family. Megumi, at first, begs Maki to take his position, but she ultimately declines, as she sees Megumi as more of the type of person who'd be able to create a family without the oppressive systems she was raised in. The two ultimately agree, and Maki is sent off to take all their cursed tools now that Megumi has been trusted with their assets moving forward. Hearing the key to their cursed weapon storage, Maki bumps into her cousin Naoya, and here we finally have a perfect narrative foil for Maki, which I think is no better demonstrated than with their first conversation with each other. Yikes, what a face. That ain't gonna heal. What are you gonna do? You judge women by their faces? I thought you only looked at their asses. In this initial conversation, we're also shown Maki was, to some extent, physically beat and humiliated by Naoya. Something I deeply appreciate in this depiction of violence towards women is that this abuse is not shown in detail. It's only shown as one panel in one page. And I find that more emotionally engaging and more respectful to the subject matter if they had done some big stupid flashback for it. At the core of this conflict, it doesn't really matter what Naoya did specifically, and through other characterization details, we can get more of a clear picture of the type of person he is. It only matters that Maki was dehumanized, and the only thing that matters about that is how she feels about it. After this, on her walk over to the vault, she encounters her mother for the first time since leaving home, where she's verbally berated by her. The same woman who was so weak-willed that she allowed herself to be subjugated within the Zenin household. And as Maki marches on, ignoring her, she says, For once, make me glad I gave birth to you, Maki. She opens the gate to the storage for the cursed tools. But upon entering, all the tools are gone. The only thing there is her father, along with a heavily wounded Mai. It's revealed Naoya, along with everyone else in the family, is planning a coup by killing Mai, Maki, and Megami as traitors of Jujutsu society. And so the battle between Maki and her father begins. And even though she manages to put herself in a winning position by smashing her father's sword, her father uses his curse technique and delivers the final blow, proclaiming that all of his children are worthless. He throws the sisters into a pit filled with cursed spirits and leaves the two of them for dead. Mai and Maki share one last chat on the beach of Mai's soul. Mai tells Maki, with the last of her strength, she'll make Maki a weapon and die. Maki, shocked by this, asks why the hell she would do that, as geese fly overhead. And Mai explains that Maki's heavenly restriction can only work if the cursed energy in Mai's body vanishes, due to them being treated as the same being by Jujutsu, since they're twins. So. She swears to Maki to take it all, and leave her only a tool. She's removing her curse from Maki's life, literally getting rid of the negative feelings and emotions that form cursed energy to set her free. She can only stop holding Maki back when her negative thoughts and feelings, her cursed energy, is gone. She leaves something in Maki's hand, asks her to promise something in return to destroy everything. This chapter's title, Ashiwo Fukumu, translates to hold a reed between the mouth. This phrase is derived from the saying, Ashiwo Fukumu Kari, which translates to a goose holding a reed between its mouth. The saying conveys the literal meaning of a good preparation. The saying pertains to migratory birds, such as geese, which hold reeds between their mouths as they prepare for a long journey. During their migration, they carry the reed and take off for their extended journey across the sea. Upon resting, they use the reed to support their wings before resuming their journey. 
Maki opens her palm to see a reed and looks out to the ocean to see the beautiful girl her sister always was. The beautiful girl that Jujutsu society didn't let her be. She wakes up to find her sister dead and a soul splitter katana in her hands. Her father at the top of the stairs senses a wild pressure and he's filled with a terror as his body reawakens to the memory of Toji Fushiguro. He readies himself with his strongest technique and swears to... But before he can even finish, he's cut down by Maki. As she spreads her wings and finally gets ready for her journey to kill all the Zenin clan. Unfortunately, the next segment of action is a bit light on thematic depth, so all I can really say is, holy shit, look how cool she is? Like, it's so rare for media to allow women to partake in pure violence and cruelty without some weird caveat, like a rape revenge narrative or some kind of paternal instinct. But here, Maki is presented as a woman getting revenge for her sister on the men in their life, and the story not only presents her as 100% totally in the right for this, but also allows her to brutally fucking kill these assholes. She's allowed to exact such wild and wicked vengeance and still be presented as kind-hearted and good by the narrative. And this is because of all the groundwork previously laid by the preferential storytelling being done by Gege Akatami in the background. It also helps that Gege Akatami is the best in the game when it comes to action paneling and art. Anyways, after such a brutal display, we finally get back to where some more interesting thematic stuff is happening. After decapitating the other family head, she has only one roadblock, Naoya. During this battle, we get to understand a bit more of Naoya's internal world as we're led into his internal monologue. And it turns down, and it turns out, deep down, he's like every other whiny misogynistic Reddit dude. In that, he's an entitled child. He feels he is owed a position amongst the greats like Gojo and Toji, and is insulted and enraged to see Maki, a woman, a woman without cursed energy, no less, rise to their ranks. And this all stems from an emasculating experience he had as a child with Toji, where he had to confront his own weakness in front of a man who didn't even have cursed energy. He was disabled. He repeats to himself how much of an imposter Maki must be, how she doesn't deserve those heights like he does. And before he can vocalize that thought, Maki splatters his skull into the pavement, where she asks him to repeat himself through his blood and shattered teeth. Also, this isn't a super smart observation or critique or anything, but God fucking damn, is it satisfying to see this misogynist piece of shit get laid out. It's just so satisfying and so well illustrated as well. After this, Maki leaves and attempts to kill her mother. Now yes slips into the family mansion and is assured that he'd gotten away from Maki, only for Maki's mother to arrive with a slit throat. And now yeah, in his weakened state, can't fight back, leaving her the chance to stab him to death with a kitchen knife. Not only was Naoya so thoroughly surpassed by Maki, but the ultimate insult of it all is that he doesn't get the honor of being killed by her. Instead, he's killed by the weakest and most pathetic woman in the family, because at the end of the day, the weakest woman is still stronger than the strongest self-entitled misogynist. And as she lays there, she finally feels pride for her two daughters, the two women who were finally able to destroy the system of oppression. After a couple of weeks, Maki travels to Tokyo Colony to help with the culling game. Hi. Yeah, um, this is editing Zeta. Uh, this, I'm, I'm recording this at like 1am. Um, 
why the fuck did I say Tokyo Colony here? Like, it so obviously says Sakurajima. I even went back and I checked my script. The script says Sakurajima, too. So, I don't know what the fuck was going on with me. Maybe I just felt like being a liar that day. Anyway, um, yeah, sorry for the interruption. I just, I, I had to say something. Like, what the fuck? What was that about? And there she bumps into Noritoshi Kamo. Super quickly, I actually want to discuss Noritoshi. See, he's an interesting pick to be a partner for Maki in this section of the story, but I do think he actually has a pretty strong reason for being here. He works as an interesting parallel to Maki. He is a man affected by the patriarchy. Noritoshi lost his relationship with his mother as a child due to her being an affair for his father. He was only allowed entrance into the Kamo family due to him receiving his family's blood manipulation technique. Once again, this is a small detail, but it goes to show Gege's willing to look at the patriarchy from an empathetic and multifaceted point of view. After the two meet up, they're immediately attacked by super fast cursed spirit. The two of them attempt to fight it, but it proves way too fast for both of them. It swoops in and pins Maki, revealing the horrible truth that it's none other than the mangled cursed spirit of Naoya back from the dead. Now, this is a twist I really love. Since the story had previously introduced the idea that sorcerers could come back as curses if they weren't killed by cursed tools or cursed energy, so the audience had proper context and information to have accurately deduced that this is possible. And I know that's the case, because multiple fans actually were able to predict this before it happened. It's such effective foreshadowing, and it works so well with the fantastic world building. Anyway, back to the manga. The two attempt to push him back and kill him. Unfortunately, they aren't fast enough, and his cursed womb hatches, and he becomes even faster. At this point, he's supersonic blitzing and destroying Maki and Noritoshi, smashing and pinning them at every turn until he backs Noritoshi into a corner. Noritoshi thinks about his mother and accepts his death. He knows there's no way out of this and that there's nothing he can do. Right before, he's saved? We flash back to these fucking goofballs backstories right after their revival for the culling game. The two of them running around begging people for katana battles and sumo matches, only to be disappointed as everybody ignores them because fucking of course, look at them. And with that, this brings them both to the scene of this battle. Rokujoshi, Neo, the sumo wrestler, and Hagane Daido, the samurai. Maki seizes the moment to break the stalemate and passes Daido her katana, since the only way to break a stalemate is to introduce a new piece to the board. She quickly realizes that after this, Daido actually can't see cursed spirits, meaning he has a similar disability to what she had at the beginning of the series. He proceeds to cut through Naoya like butter, even though he can't explicitly see him. He just states that he sees everything else. Leaving Maki to wonder what's making the difference in their ability. What makes her different than Toji? What is she not seeing? It's then amongst the chaos that Mia offers her a sumo match. The insanity of it. To ask for a fucking sumo match in a life or death battle? And yet, despite it all, despite how serious things are, Maki immediately obliges. Seeing this, Noritoshi scolds her, because obviously, what the fuck is she doing? And to that, she simply says that she's been overthinking and she needs to blow off some steam. A domain barrier engulfs the two warriors, and the two begin. Maki is immediately outmatched, until Mia stops and offers to show her what Daido is seeing. And in that, Maki is finally able to learn from him. I think it's interesting, the story immediately draws a parallel here between Maki and her previous teachers, 
She was unable to learn from them because, well, they were operating under different rules. Gojo is the most blessed man in the universe, and anybody else would have cursed energy. But, through Mia, she's able to learn something she never could from her other teachers, due to them having a shared disability. The two, through battling, find common ground in this moment, and Daido teaches her to be grounded to allow her mind to be free from the curses and the other people she's become entangled with. Her mind is wrapped around Naoya, her family, her sister, the chaos, the bloodshed. But to free yourself from it is to properly see the world for what it is, to smell light, to taste sound, to allow yourself to enjoy everything and to free yourself from the trauma you've experienced. So the two clash one last time, as Maki can finally see the world for what it is through this sumo match. And the barrier collapses with Maki victorious. Maki leaps and begins fighting Naoya's curse by herself, her ability to see every aspect of the world, the air pressure, the wind, everything, even on an atomic level, unclouded by the baggage she had her whole life, but yet still being informed by what she's lived through. Something only she can see. A life of trouble and rot and discrimination has caused her pain, but it also allows her to see the beauty of the world for what it truly is. And with it, she beats Naoya down like a plaything. She barely has to try as she joyously swings through the air, smiling and grinning like a fool because to her, this life is beautiful and this is amusing. That is, until Naoya feeling completely and totally emasculated and being reminded of his feelings of entitlement towards the status as the strongest, his entitlement to the position that Toji and Gojo had, breaks down and uses his last resort, his domain expansion. Now, really quick, I want to discuss the imagery around Naoya's domain expansion as it's incredibly yonic. That means it looks like a vagina and uterus. So what did Gege mean by this? Well, I think it's pretty simple. This entire domain is symbolic of Naoya's entitlement, both towards women and their power. His entire character is built around his need to control both his bloodline and the women in his life, both of which are natural ties to the imagery of a uterus the source of birth, and the one thing misogynistic men want control over more than anything. With this domain, he easily dispatches Daido and Mia, but only upon defeating them, the men in the room, he realizes. He's lost track of Maki. Even through all of this, he's managed to ignore the only woman who can stop him, but surely she has to be in here somewhere. She was right next to him. Right. He realizes the barrier around his domain ignored her. Just like his own narrow worldview, his domain also managed to miss the one woman who was destined to surpass him. He attempts to attack her, but unfortunately, even the sure hit effect of his domain technique can't recognize her due to her lack of cursed energy. Just like he did his whole life, Naoya's technique failed to account for Maki, both as a woman and as somebody with no cursed energy. The barrier collapses as Naoya is exercised from this world. And finally, a demonic warrior equal to Toji Zenin is fully realized. I love this fight. It's such a perfect encapsulation of both Naoya 
and Maki's characters. An ignorant curse of a man, a literal symbolic force of pure negativity and misogyny, attempting to leave a stain on a powerful woman's legacy, only to be completely crushed when the aspects of her he denied get in the way of him seeing her. And for Maki, this battle is to free her from the curse that she has, her past. Her freedom didn't come from subserving the patriarchy like her sister or her mother. It instead came from destroying it and allowing herself to heal from the hurt it left her. To enjoy the moment and to love it. To smile and play with the wind because life is beautiful. And no piece of shit man, mom, or sister should keep you from seeing that. And I think that's a really beautiful message. So before I leave, I want to answer one more question before we close out. And that's why I love Maki so much. It's simply because she's one of the very few women in media I can see myself in. It also helps that she's the trope of having no superpowers is my superpower. Gotta be one of my favorite genders. And yet, in that classic trope, Gege Akatami takes the time to lovingly and thoroughly explore the ideas of disability and womanhood. This is the most beautiful use of that trope I've ever seen in media because I can see myself in it. I have a disability I have to work around. I'm a woman who struggles with other women putting me down, and they allow the narrative to show her as brutally violent, and she also gets to kill her oppressors and still be in the right. And that's fucking sick. She's sarcastic and cruel, but also loving and kind. She's funny and goofy, but serious and badass. She's the type of woman I kind of want to see myself as. I hope this video was effective in communicating everything I think about her, because she is my favorite character from this manga. One of my favorite characters I've ever read in a shonen manga in totality, honestly. But most of all, if you take anything from this video, there's one thing I want you to take away. Go completely obliterate your oppressor, sweetheart. It's self-care. Hi, welcome to the end of uh, the this video. Um, so, I didn't mean to vanish for a year. Uh, it's just things work out like that. Uh, I was just so mad my last video was about transgender people in video games, and Bridget came out a fucking month after I finished editing it. So, fuck me, I guess. But hey, I'm back now. Um, I want to say thank you all so much for the incredible reception I got on my last video. Uh, out of everything I expected to happen to it, uh, getting 15,000 views was not one of them. So thanks. It's a big reason of why I decided to come back. I loved making videos and seeing that they impacted so many people meant a lot, you know? Really quickly, I'm going to give a shout out to Lele and their blog, Read Jujutsu Kaisen. I use their information on the translation aspects uh, for a few different things, so I absolutely recommend checking them out. They're a great resource. Uh, their blog is super entertaining. Whatever I make next, by the way, uh, probably not going to be as heavy as this video. <laughs> My last two videos have both been pretty heavy, so I think I'm going to try for something a little lighter next time, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. I, I really enjoyed making this video. I had a great time. Uh, I hope you all had a great time, too. Um, and if you had an awesome time, I'd recommend checking out my other videos, which I think are pretty good. There's probably two of them on the screen right now. Um, and if you want to see what I'm doing in the future, feel free to subscribe to me on YouTube, or you can check out my Tumblr page. Uh, I do not have a Twitter. I guess it's called X now. I don't have either. Uh, I find that website super toxic. So I just use Tumblr. Uh, and I have an open ask box there. And I'll try my best to answer any questions I get through it. 
Uh, Otherwise, I hope you have an amazing day. Remember to exfoliate and you're beautiful.